remain standing for the reading of God's word as it comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and, him, and in him there is no darkness of all, at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your word. We ask that you would allow your word not to return void, but that you would accomplish what you desire to do within us. Lord, we thank you that we are your children, but what we will be has not yet been revealed. So, Lord, we ask you to continue your work within us, perfecting us into the image of your Son until the day of Christ's appearing. In his name we pray. Amen. We're in our series called Four Weeks, Small Tweaks, Large Peaks. And we've been talking about little tweaks that we can make in our faith journey, our lives as, as disciples of Christ that can, over, over time, create large peaks or places in our spiritual lives maybe that we have not uh, enjoyed fully. Maybe we've tasted those places, but just really can't seem to embrace them fully in our lives for some reason. So this morning we're going to be talking about forgiveness, but not so much forgiveness, but the pathway to forgiveness. And the pathway to forgiveness is through confession. Uh, we're reading from the book of John. Of course, John is written, by, is written by the Apostle John, the same John who wrote the fourth gospel, who wrote the uh, book of, of Revelation. There's, there's a, this is a, what's called a Catholic letter or universal letter, meaning that it was not written to a specific group of people, but it was written to the entire body of Christ in that day. There's a couple of little nuances about the book of 1 John and also John's writings, and it's this. He uses contrast quite a bit. He uses contrast like light and dark, good, evil, lie, truth, love, hate. We even touched on some of those in the text this morning. He starts out by talking about the incarnation of Christ and then moves directly into the subject of forgiveness of our sins. And I think sometimes in the church today, we can focus so much upon forgiveness that we forget or overlook a bigger picture. And that bigger picture is that we have been reconciled to the Father. It's not that God just forgives us of our sins, which is a gracious gift within, within itself. But what God through Jesus Christ has done is that He has reconciled us. He has broken down the barrier wall of hostility that, that divided man from God. Jesus destroyed that and He has reconciled us into a relationship with God the Father. And I think we can lose sight of that one little truth that is so critical in our lives. So how do we come to the place of forgiveness? It's through confession. Well, let's just ask ourselves honestly. How comfortable are we at, confess, at, the, at confession of our sins? How comfortable are we in the truth or the understanding that God has indeed forgiven and pardoned you and me? Not, not on a theological level, but on a felt sense level. The hymn that we uh, owe for a thousand tongues to sing, the last verse says that we shall feel our sins forgiven. Do we feel our sins forgiven? I would submit to you that we may not. We may not. And I think that leads to the reluctance in confessions of our faith. 
Oh, I'm sorry, confessions of our sins. Confession of our sins. Our key verse is verse 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son purifies us from all sin. Great verse. If you highlight, underline in your Bibles, that's a great place to underline and highlight. So where did we learn to confess our sins? Well, if you grew up in more liturgical type churches such as ours, such as the United Methodist Church, other, other denominations, not so much in the more free-flowing forms of worship, uh, but in, in our traditions, I think we learn to confess through the liturgies of the church. The Apostles' Creed, we say, we believe in the forgiveness of sins. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In our communion liturgy, we, we make a confession, but that confession is broad and general. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We've, we've failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We've rebelled against your law. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For, forgive us and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a general confession. I think those things are meant to teach us that, A, we are to confess, but it also is there to teach us that we have a promise, we have a covenant that God will forgive us when we confess our sins. But again, I ask you the question and myself, how comfortable are we really at owning our sins before God? I would submit that we are not all that comfortable. There was a young pastor who uh, just graduated from seminary, was appointed to his first church as an associate, had been there about a year and was going through his annual evaluation with the senior minister. And the guy came out of seminary, just set on fire and had some great ideas to reach new people and reach the millennials and uh, just bring in new folks into the church. One was he installed an automated pew system. That when you walked in the back door, there were two pews, on the, one on the left, one on the right. And when they filled, they pushed all the way up to the front row. And then another one would pop up. It would fill up and go all the way to the front. And the church filled up from the front to the back. And so the senior pastor was just commending him on that. It was ingenious. It was beautiful. The other thing that he implemented was drive through the communion. You could drive through like at the bank, communion elements would slide out, take communion, get, never get out of your car, drive on. And communion numbers went way up. And boy, the senior minister was just commending him on that beautiful idea on drive through communion. But the next thing he implemented was drive through confession. Senior minister struggled with that one a little bit. And he said, you know, that's a great idea. He said, you know, the number of confessions have gone way up. He said, but I just struggle with the name of it. And the, and the young pastor was just kind of crushed and hurt, you know. And he said, you know, I just don't think to, to that, that, that confession should be called toot and tell it. But is that sort of the way? I think we take confession lightly because we take sin way too lightly. We take confession way too lightly. It's not that you have to confess to me. That's not what we're talking about. But we, do, we take confession of our sin way too lightly because we take our sin way too lightly. We justify our sin. Follow this scenario. We are on business, we travel a lot, and we're in the hotel, and it's late at night, we can't sleep, and we flip on the TV, and boom, there's the naughty channels. We get in the habit of flipping on the naughty channels. And we say to ourselves, well, it's, it's just a little bit of naughty. Or then we uh, have opportunity, we maybe handle a lot of cash. And so there's the opportunity that we begin to take a little bit of the money. 
And we justify and says, well, it's just a little bit of money. And besides, I work hard and I'm underpaid and my boss is a jerk. Lust. Well, it's not lust. I'm just admiring God's handiwork. There was a, uh, uh, when I was in Wrens, tr- absolute true story here. We were, uh, I-, I was serving the Wrens church and uh, some guys came for band practice one night and, they, and one guy walked into the sound booth and there was a, a baby snake in the sound booth. So he gets the snake and is going out the door with it and another guy, Ed and I, were standing on the front porch as he walked out and I said, Michael, what kind of snake is it, do you think? He said, I think it's a rattlesnake, a baby rattlesnake. So our sign on the marquee had just been changed that morning. And the, um, the, uh, 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 Ed, who was in the band, he and I were standing on the porch as Michael walked off. And Ed tapped me on the shoulder. He said, boy, look at the sign. And this is what the sign said. The problem with sin is we treat it like a cream puff and not a rattlesnake. I was like, okay, God, <laughs> I'm a slow learner, I know. It's not what you're saying, but who are you saying this to, you know? True story. I believe God has, has taught me over the last few years something about confession. And one of the things that, that I think maybe, maybe you do, or maybe it was just me, I did general confession in prayer. When I would pray somewhere very early in my prayer, I would, wor- I would say something to the effect, forgive me of my sins. A, it was a broad general statement or confession asking God to forgive me of my sins. I didn't list them. I didn't enumerate them. I didn't detail them. It was just a broad general statement or request of God. I, be- I don't believe this, this type of confession, of course, is, is good, but I think there's a better way. I think we can tweak something in our confession that will really enable us to, over time, to realize something of the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God that maybe a general confession may not provide for us. So, why is a generalized confession maybe not, what's the problems with it? This is how I see and understand it. Number one, if, if, if all we do is make a general confession, then, um, then it's a constant reminder of my sin nature. If, 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 if in my prayer I was saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins, it was an admission, so to speak, that, of course, I am a sinner, that we are, that I am forgiven, but I still stand in need of continual forgiveness. I still stand in need, in my mind, I was still standing in need of redemption, of, re, of being reclaimed over and over and over and over. The second thing is, it, well, it was a continual reminder of my sin nature or my fallen nature. I didn't need reminding of that. I knew it every day, right? The second thing that I see here is that, that uh, it, re- it requires little trust in Christ's atonement. If I, if, if I make a broad general confession of my sin, then I don't have to deal with the, with the atoning death of Christ that covers my sin because, it's, because my confession is nonspecific. So therefore, I really do not experience the atoning forgiveness of God through a broad general confession. Number three, it requires little personal responsibility for my walk. It requires little responsibility on my part because I can, I can toy with greed or envy or lust or whatever it is and then just say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. So therefore, I don't have to deal with the actuality that I am doing these things. The fourth one is this, and this sounds harsh, 
This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. He said it's cheap grace. It's a form of cheap grace. It's, 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 the, it's the person desiring forgiveness of sin without confession and without repentance. It's cheap grace. There's nothing cheap about the grace of God. But yet, but yet according to Bonhoeffer, we cheapen it when we desire forgiveness without confession of our sin and without repentance of our sins. I believe what happens when, when, when we, I say we, I guess I should say, say me, I don't know what to say. Okay, thank you. <laughs> when we make a general confession, forgive me of my sins, I believe somewhere deep down we're saying, I know that, there, I, know that, that I am guilty of my sins and I still need forgiveness of my sins because of this guilt. You follow that logic? Okay, here's, here, here's, our, uh, here's our key verse. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Let's walk through this real quick. Uh, light, if I walk in the light, if I walk in the knowledge, the truth, the understanding of who Jesus Christ is, if I walk in the light as He is in the light. Now, this is, this is critical. I'm not talking about quality, I'm, I'm not talking about quantity of light, because we can't have the same quantity of light as Jesus Christ. But what we are speaking of is the quality of light. The same, if I, if you, if we walk in the same quality of light that is in Jesus Christ, then look what happens. We have fellowship with one another. What's the word fellowship? We talked about it last week. It's koinia. We are learning that koinia or fellowship is faith essential relationships. That's the reason we're starting crews, small groups. Fellowship is faith essential relationships. And so who is this fellowship with? Of course, it's with one another, right? The body of Christ. But it's also with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are in fellowship and communion with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and one another. Those are faith essential relationships. He goes on to say, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. The, the word purify there uh, is where we get the word catharsis. How many times have we owned up to something? Maybe even as a child, I can remember that. As a child, only, well, actually my brother told on me is what happened. I didn't own it. My brother told on me. But boy, when he told on me, you know what happened? It was just this like, whew, man, at least it's out. You know, I don't have to hide this thing anymore. And there was a huge sigh of relief. It was, it was, it was an act of catharsis. You've experienced that when we've owned something, admitted it to a friend, and we feel the release of the tension and the fear and the guilt and all that stuff. Well, that's sort of what that means, but it means something so much more important than that. The idea of catharsis here or, pur or purifies is where it says, I purify. Who's the I? Us? No. Look at the text. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. It's one thing for us to confess so that we feel better, but that's not the reason why we confess. We confess because He has, prom he has promised to cleanse us from all of our sin. But here's, but, but here's another point. Look at verse 10 in the text. If you have your Bibles, in which I know you do, Look at verse, at verse 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word unrighteousness there is adikia. And what it means is guilt. Guilt. 
The very thing that I, the reason why I was making general confessions, Father, forgive me of my sins, was because of the guilt of the sins that had already been forgiven that I had not received cleansing for. I had not applied the forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ through the blood of Christ who, who purifies us from all sin and then He he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The stain of sin is what keeps us in bondage. Keeps us in bondage of continually confessing, forgive me of my sins, forgive me of my sins, forgive me of my sins. It's like God is screaming to us, I've already forgiven you. But we keep bringing it up. Here's where the tweaking comes in. Number one, when we, conf when we confess, identify and own sin or failures with specificity. Name it. Detail it if you need to. Reflect on, on actually what from our motive, what we have done and why we have done it. Not necessarily why, but, but confess specifically before God. Own it. Not generalized, but with specificity. Second thing is, receive forgiveness through, the prom through Christ's promise. What is Christ's promise? 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, He is faithful, meaning that He will. And He is just, meaning that He is justified in forgiving you and me. Our forgiveness is not based upon uh, how eloquently I confess it, or we confess it. It's simply agreeing with God, I blew it. Be it a big blow or a major blow, as Tina's sermon, children's sermon went. Third thing, appropriate, this is, this is so important, appropriate the cleansing efficacy of Christ's blood. Apply the cleansing efficacy of Christ's blood. Why? Because that purifies us from all unrighteousness all adikia, all guilt, all shame affiliated, associated, connected with my sin through the blood of Christ that is cleansed. That is so critically important. I believe that's the part that we often miss. We want to atone for our own sins through guilt and shame and condemnation and Jesus is saying, I cleanse you from all effects of the sin upon your heart and your soul. I cleanse that. Lastly, when practical, this is really important, when practical, right the wrong. Whenever possible, whenever practical, and that take, that will take a lot of judgment and discernment on your part. Right the wrong. If I've stolen from someone, I'm, I may need to make ways to make restitution. It may be that I cannot make restitution, but it may mean that I do need to confess it to them and own it. Here's a personal tweak. When's the last time we asked our spouse to forgive us? When's the last time we've confessed to our spouse a wrong that we've done against them or our children or we, our parents? A, a well-placed, I am sorry for blank. Specify. I'm sorry for disrespecting you. 
I am sorry for whatever it might be. Boy, that goes a long ways toward healing of relationships. Goes a long way toward our spiritual maturity as well. So how do we put out into the deep? Well, sometimes it's just launching. It's just doing it. Not doing it because we're, not confessing because we're comfortable with it, because it's not. Sometimes we do it because it's the thing that is the right thing to do. And all we're doing in confession is simply agreeing with God. He already knows your sin and mine. But here's what happens when we experience the cleansing of the stain of guilt is that it frees us for joyful obedience. Without that, we will still be caught up in the circle of of wanting forgiveness, desiring forgiveness when it's already been given to us through Christ. Four weeks, our third tweak, but it can generate great peaks. Peaks of peace, of joy, of love, of delight in Him that we may not have experienced before, or maybe moments of. And He wants us to live in it. So may it be so, we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.